I've uh, been detecting since, well, 35 plus years, I suppose. In the early 80s, I started detecting mainly in the West Country, particularly around the Wiltshire counties. Uh, mainly searched sort of um, arable pastures, um, probably found the Roman period most prolific with a splattering of Celtic, a little bit of Celtic in amongst it. But medieval is my real passion, I think, medieval yeah. periods. A little Roman, I think, isn't it? People often wonder, um, detecting success, what makes a successful detectorist? That's obviously commitment. Um, you've, got to, you've got to be out there, you've got to walk the fields. And it's down to attitude. Um, obviously, you need to find um, some good land. Uh, if, if, you, if you haven't got no land and people haven't walked across it or lived on it over the years, then your finds are going to reflect that. Some people just have a small amount of acreage, you know, but you've got to work at it. You've got to have the commitment and, um, you know, you've got to look at the fields and try and work out where people sat, lost stuff. I mean, it's down to luck at the end of the day, but um, use your eyes, look on the ground, look for pottery, signs of habitation dark soil, black soil, which shows, you know, people's lived on there over the years. Looking for mounds and dips and fields that might be a feature, a long forgotten feature. Um, maybe try the bigger coils, if you've got a bigger coil, just to sort of home in on areas where it's a bit more busy, you know, with start getting the iron. Um, iron's a good thing, although it can drive you mad sometimes, but it shows you're in the area where you maybe need to reduce coil sizes and get in amongst the iron and try and listen for the targets. Targets will be there. If there's iron, there'll be targets there. You just got to work at it and have the right equipment. Oh, look at that. Look at that, Stu. Got it? <laughs> that, I do believe, happy days. Yeah, I think it's fair to say um, with the XP Deus, I've become more technical with it and thought about it a little bit more. Obviously seeing things on uh, various channels and uh, you sort of um, start tweaking a bit more and understanding what you're doing. Nice. Uh, the, the, the dais allows that pretty good. You can adapt to most, almost any site, in fact, or any site. The ORX is obviously a different machine um, than the, uh, the dais. So um, it's more of a pick it up, connect it together and uh, switch on and go. And um, it does what it says on the tin, you know, it just, uh, get on and spend more time in the field. You don't need to do the adjustments. It's got adjustments, obviously, but you don't need to do as many adjustments as the dais. You get a bit more out of the dais, um, you know, suiting the ground conditions. But most ground conditions, I've got some horrible ground conditions, lots of iron, not so much mineralization, but the Orx, ORX, has no problem coping with it. Wow. I haven't got my glasses on, but I can see that's sort of almost a silver, isn't it? I suppose most of the time I'm using higher, not high end, but middle sort of 18 kilohertz, maybe up to 30, because it suits the sites brandy. that I'm on. Um, they've obviously got iron, lots of iron and lots of habitation. If you're searching on a hilltop and there's no noise, you know, it's, the ground's not talking to you then you can lower the frequencies and maybe go for deeper targets. If I go on to um, places where I haven't tried before and it allows, then I'll drop the, the frequencies. The dreaded trees. <laughs> Approaching landowners, it's quite difficult. Um, you've got to pick your moments when to approach them. Um, obviously these days with emails and not so much letters now though, being group, various groups, various forums, you can get in contact with them. They get inundated with stuff like that. It's always best if you can to do a, not so much a cold call. You've got to pick your moments to call on them. Um, but they like, I think it's better to do face to face um, when asking for permission. But having said that, that's hard. It's, it's the hardest thing to do to drive up to a big house or a farm, you know, and then try and promote yourself as a responsible detectorist. That's a nice high tone, isn't it? How do I see the future of the hobby? I wonder. Well, it's changed, and we all, none of us like changes. When I first got in it, it was um, 
Well, we had the arc of the them and us, and I think there's a lot of that still about the them and us. Oh, oh, I've seen that little hint of silver then. <laughs> oh, another button. For me, has it changed a lot? I can still go out as long as I got permission. Got a friendly farmer or landowner, you can still find stuff. I think the fines liaison officers are, you know, they work closer with most detectorists, but as long as you uh, have a bit of contact with them, we should be able to work together. Most of the museums are filled with our stuff, you know, and um, they learn so much from what we find. So we just need to work together and hopefully we'll see how it goes, you know. It's, it's, it's improved, it's improved since the 80s, I think. We've had a good day today. We found some nice bits and pieces. I'll show it to the flow and then we move on. Tomorrow's another day. Scrubby. Sometimes you just fo follow your nose, you know. I got a nice Roman nose, so I tend to, I've got to follow it. Um, you just get a feel for it. It's, it comes with experience, obviously, you know. Um, people that's been detecting for have a long periods of time will look at a field and think they'll head straight off to a certain area. So it's intuition, gut feeling call it what you want, but that normally brings about fines well, and maybe success, I did see it. if you're lucky. There he is. Another dreaded. <laughs> yep. Bang, bang. <laughs>